this Tell Me More session, I'm joined by Daniel Thoma from Switzerland. Daniel, welcome. Thank you so much. I'd nice love to you uh, to tell me more about biomaterials that can influence the soft tissue healing. You're a true expert in that. You're doing a lot of research in that field. So we are here in the Milan Congress 2024. Where are we in I terms of this topic? I think we had a very interesting session this morning where we basically covered together with Otto Sur and Juan Blanco um, the overall topic of uh, looking at the soft tissue aspect in general, the wound healing and whether there could be some improvement. And I was covering a topic whether, uh, where we would basically look at biomaterials and whether some of these biomaterials could have an influence in general on soft tissue healing. And if we keep the questions so broad, could they have an influence? Yeah, I think you see uh, soft tissue augmentation procedures are uh, frequently performed predominantly in the aesthetic zone in order to improve aesthetics. And most often we always look at maybe the efficacy of a treatment. And there is uh, clear evidence in the literature that when we do a comparison between autogenous tissue grafts and uh, biomaterials, the biomaterials are slightly inferior. And why is that? Because we lose part of the materials in the healing? Well, or? Usually the augmentation or the amount of augmentation is more or less the same, but there might be a little bit more shrinkage over time. So if you look at a bit of longer time period, there is more shrinkage. Yeah. So purely focusing on efficacy, probably gain more. But in contrast, they do have uh, a lot of advantages. And most importantly, when we talk to our patients, because uh, whenever you have to harvest autogenous tissue, being it bone or soft tissue, there is uh, some uh, morbidity associated with the procedures. So that's the place where uh, biomaterials come into place. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's quite important that we do have also research-wise and obviously also in the clinic a focus on uh, maybe alternatives uh, to autogenous craft. And what type of materials are currently used and, and most promising? Where, where is science in terms of evidence? I think when we look at biomaterials for soft tissue augmentation procedures, there have been studies maybe 25 years ago and there have been a series of different products being available. And probably the most well-researched products are uh, collagen-based matrices for indications of uh, augmenting maybe volume to get better aesthetics and maybe also gain of keratinized tissue to improve the tissue quality around the limb plants. Yeah, so you say there, there is an influence on the healing. We also say in the end, perhaps a little bit more shrinkage, but couldn't you just overdimension that initially because it's a foreign material anyway? That's an excellent thought, but uh, I guess there is biological limit on how much we can augment. And uh, there appears to be way more remodeling when we use some biomaterials. The question at the end, of course, is how much do you need? It's not always about uh, the best efficacy. Maybe you would also be happy with maybe 80% of the outcome in terms of efficacy. Yeah. And um, apart from this, what I covered is uh, also the associated morbidity, which is then reduced. But uh, when we today, but, th but that's mainly because of the you don't have the second side. You don't, you have, don't the have the second, second side. You don't exactly. need to harvest. Or is there also less morbidity in the in this place where you augment or do the surgery? No, I guess the, the morbidity is mostly associated okay. with yeah. the harvesting procedure, which would also, from a clinical point of view, would actually also save you a lot of time because you don't have a second site where you do need to do an anesthesia, maybe harvest tissue, and maybe have a bit of an uncontrolled bleeding thereafter, and patients that start complaining. Yeah, but. Uh, I think we were also covering a little bit the topic this morning specifically where we would look at maybe some further improvements because uh, we should always be aware that not all the treatment goes according to plan. Mm. So, uh, well, we what are some of the things that can go wrong when you work with foreign bi biomaterials? I don't think it's specifically with biomaterials. Uh, whenever we do surgical procedures, for example, there might be complications associated with the procedure like most common one is that when you remove the suture, you realize, oh, the wound hasn't healed. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and that's no difference whether you work with uh, autogenous or foreign material. Well, that's part of research that has been done uh, around the world, uh, looking at uh, comparative studies, controlled, randomized controlled clinical studies, where people would compare two treatment options. And when we then focus more on the outcomes, look, well, can they, biomaterials, maybe reduce the extent of untahistances or the rate of untahistances? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's not really true. Okay. No difference or no improvement? It's not really an improvement, maybe even a disadvantage. And now uh, it's a good question. Well, why do we obviously see maybe more complications, even more complications with uh, different some, materials? Some, some data or some research is su suggesting that as well. 
there's not really data on this that would basically explain us why we do have sl a slightly higher rate of wound dehiscences, mm. but it may be the fact that with the, the standard of care, the use of a torturous tissue, people would have way more experience. So ah, whenever you start using other materials, there might also be a learning curve associated with something like that. And maybe people would also more specifically look at wound dehiscences. Yeah, okay. So you say some of the research could be either biased or influenced by other factors than the one that we're looking for. Well, it's based on randomized controlled clinical studies. So the bias is relatively low, but certainly there is an associated learning curve with yeah. uh, whatever yeah. procedure we change, whatever biomaterials we introduce. Yeah. And I guess if you would run this type of study several times, you'd probably be able to decrease uh, the rate of complications. So where do we stand now then because we see okay we see obviously patient benefits mm, we're not sure if we really see biological benefits what do you think is the way forward i think the war, the way forward that i see the, the end is certainly that we try to more personalize uh treatments because you see in the majority of the patients uh, maybe a traditional autogenous soft tissue graft might work really well when you on the other hand, really take care about your patients. You probably choose a biomaterial. Right? If, if I, from a patient perspective, could choose and you offer yeah. me this, I was like, well, if, if the other one is just as good, give yeah. me a, uh, exactly. a biomaterial. Exactly. That, but then the question comes to play, you know, is there maybe, are there maybe specific indications where an alternative like a biomaterial would, have a, would be a better indication? So it's about finding out in which clinical scenario it might be better to use maybe traditional uh, autogenous soft tissue graft and which specific indication it might be useful to look for an alternative. So where are we now? Do we either have already some clear indications when one or the other scenario is preferred or perhaps the other side of the same coin? Do we already see risk factors when you should go for one or the other options? I don't think at the moment that we have identified specific risk factors. Um, in general, it's probably up to the clinician to decide on which treatment modality he's going to use. And we should, uh, when we treat patients, always go back to scientific data and look at what kind of indications um, have been used using maybe biomaterials or autogenous soft tissue grafts. Exactly. So that's an advice for clinicians, I guess, watching yes. this. Now, you're also very active yourself as a scientist in this field. What is the next step? that science need to make to improve and develop the insight in these new materials? What do you hope the type of studies that are being initiated? Well, I see when you look at uh, the type of studies, and I think that's something very general, what we need to do research about are two things. First of all, we need to personalize implant therapy. And second, we also... What do you mean with that? Personalize, personalize actually like in, means... In what dimension? When you have a 20-year-old patient, an 8-year-old patient, the treatment is going to be the same. Right now? Right now. Ah. And that's probably not what you want. Exactly. Because maybe the healing is different in an 80-year-old compared to a 20-year-old. Yeah. We're not talking about systemic diseases and all yeah, yeah, yeah. these so, other problems. Yeah, and then you just refer to the healing, but I can imagine in all the aspects of implantology, there could be differences whether you're dealing with the, the one type or the other type of patient. Absolutely. Clear, clear, Absolutely. Clear. And you say currently... In the and current day and age, it's quite standardized. It's highly standardized. You exactly. would actually apply the same treatment approach for all patients, independent of maybe, maybe risk factors exactly. and uh, age exactly. and gender, whatever you want. So to you say we need more research in that field and further yes. develop the indications or the risk factors that determine the appropriate protocol. Absolutely. And uh, on the other hand, we should probably also provide clinicians, we should have a focus on clinicians, provide them with maybe treatment protocols that are easier to apply. Mm. Because specifically when you talk about maybe these regenerative procedures that really deal with, uh, well, they're kind of complex to perform as well. And these need to be simplified in the future. So biomaterials could be part of simplified clinical protocols. Yeah. If you do have simplified clinical protocols, may pay more patients may profit from such a treatment clear and obviously also more clinicians of course so the Everyone, focus yeah. is not only on the patient being more personalized but also on the clinician to have 
easier clinical protocols. Yeah. And you, you say to your fellow, peop- fellow scientists, keep an eye on seeing how we can simplify, simplify is not, maybe not the right word, but make them less complex once they get into the clinic. Maybe less complex, maybe faster, you know, just that, let's say, general clinicians are uh, able to perform these procedures in a successful way. Exactly. Well, that's a very clear call to action, Daniel. Uh, I look forward to hopefully chatting with you about that in some of the future EAO congresses. Thank you Thank so you much. for your time. It has been a pleasure. Thank you.